Aloha and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host Justini Spiritu. Sitting next to me every week is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Aloha. And to remind you, we bring farmers and all kinds of people that are involved with the local food system here on Oahu as well as the other islands we have in Oahu residents today. I'm super excited to have our friend on and if you feel so inclined, uh, please you're always welcome to tweet in questions or comments at Think Tech High. We also have the ability to receive phone calls from you folks. So Whoa. join the conversation Whoa. and call the hotline at 415-871-2474. Uh, so Matthew will introduce our guest. Now. Thanks, Justine. Um, so yeah, once again, we have another great guest, a good friend of ours, Ignacio Fleischer, uh, who is with Hawaii Venison, is the founder. But as you're going to find out throughout the next 45 minutes with us, that he's a lot more than just a founder of one business, but multiple businesses. So Ignacio, a.k.a. Iggy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we've been... 45 minutes. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> no, no. yeah, I think I only told him 10 <laughs> minutes. So, oh, yeah, sorry. It's no too now. Uh, it's going to go by so fast that you're going to be shocked. Sweet. That's good. <laughs> so um, let's just go right into it. Um, well, give us a little background on... Hawaii Venison, and then we'll get a little more background on yourself. Sure. So Hawaii Venison technically started officially two months ago, but we've kind of been in the business for a while, uh, sourcing food, and um, it's been a long process, and, and it's pretty special because what we have is USDA certified venison, which is different than buying venison from someone out of a truck <laughs> on the back of the somewhere. truck. <laughs> yeah, sounds somewhat different. Yeah. <laughs> so explain like, with a, so you have a, a venison product, but why is that so significant to get that USDA certification? So the USDA certification um, was got by Desmond Manaba, who did a lobbying, and he's on Molokai. Mm. Uh, and they have the Molokai Wildlife Management, and I'm kind of taking over all of the marketing on the island because he's over there, so it's hard for yeah. him to do. And um, it's pretty special because we're the only second wild game USDA certification uh, doing wild game, basically. And, yeah. and so the only other one is in Texas, and they're, they're, uh, they're, even though they're on a farm, they still have that certification of mm -hmm. wild game. So it's it's different than farming venison or things like that. So. Yeah. And was this a, a bison that they're doing in Texas? I know some. They're other... doing venison. Oh, and, venison as well. And uh, some bison, but yeah, it's the only venison that's certified outside of the the guys in Texas with access deer as well. Okay. And uh, it's really hard to do, and that's why there's not a lot of people doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, there's very strict guidelines and rules that you have to go out at night, no full moon, has to be muzzle shot, head shot only. Oh, wow. Or you can't use a meat. Sorry. Part of it is because um, what happens is that if you scare the animal, yeah. then the meat gets tainted. And, oh, and then okay. it has to be cleaned right, right away. Got to get back to the slaughter facility and clean and... So there's a lot of steps, and people sometimes say, why is it so expensive? I'm like, well, they're not more expensive than a steak, so, yeah. but you're getting a leaner, better product. And, you know, we take an approach, um, kind of a traditional approach. I'm Apache, and so prayer is important to us, and, you know, about the animal, it's given its life for us. And it's not like we're going to church or over a Bible, but it's important to give thanks for that animal. And then... The hunter does the same as well, so uh, there's a deeper connection to what we have, and, mm. and I think that also makes it special. Wow. So when you talk about being certified, is that the organization is certified or a particular just one person? It's certified? the organization, so and the process. So the whole process has to, from point A all the way to delivery, that everyone involved is certified. Um, the hunting is certified and done with the USDA inspector and then the processing plant as well. Mm. So those are the main keys. Once it's got that stamp, then it can go to other people to do other things with it. Mm. But between those two, it's very strict. So you as the distributor isn't certified? Don't need no, to be but we have to have a certified facility uh, with the state. So, you know, a kitchen, certified kitchen. And, oh, okay. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So another significant thing about um, harvesting venison is that it's uh, kind of a wild animal that's, um, I don't know if it's invasive, but it, it's kind of growing out of control. Like it creates problems for other industries. Is that, is that right? They're like rabbits, a like little bit bigger rabbits. rabbits. But, um, so venison first introduced to a King Kamehameha V around 1850s, 1857. It came from Japan. Okay and um, started off with a couple, or seven I think it was total deer. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a source for an extra walk around food. Mm -hmm. And the population exploded and now it's on Lanai. First came to Molokai, then to Lanai, and then Maui, and then some of it's on Big Island as well now. Oh, wow. Population is huge. On Maui it's close to 57,000. Uh, Lanai has about 34,000, it's not exact numbers, and, um, and then Molokai, I think, is between 45 to 50,000 okay. deer. And so they destroy farming, native crops. Uh, so they, they're, they're eating other crops. Yeah, and then they also trample through them. And the, right. So there's a lot of problems that people don't realize. So people go, oh, poor Bambi, they're so cute, <laughs> they're beautiful. They are beautiful animals, yeah. right? Their hides are gorgeous. and They taste good, too. They, they taste delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is that people don't realize is that the other option is shooting them out of a helicopter and letting them rot, which still affects our environment wow. if those animals rot and, and we're not eating them. So the idea was that we hunt it in a proper way and then that we use it for food and then we try to use everything. So uh, tanning the hides and using all of the animal for different things, including like dog food, whatever we don't use for human consumption. Um, it, what happens when you have thousands of uh, these herds running with thousands and they're trampling the dirt, they're trampling native plants and that displaces, you know, the birds, it displaces native. So all of our flora and fauna is affected by this. Not only that, with this trampling going on, the dirt get kick, gets oh, kicked yeah. up and then it runs off to our beaches and mm -hmm. kills the reef. So then it affects our fishing as well. Yeah. So it's important, what's being done is important. It's not just like, let's go shoot some deer. Right, right. We're actually doing conservation and management rather than eradication. Well, on, on that note then, do we want to see more folks that are certified to hunt? Is that there, a goal? There are more people trying to get online. It's, it's a hard process because mm -hmm. If you're not doing it exact, then you can get shut down pretty quick. And yeah. if you don't have your game plan together and exact and on point, literally, um, you're going to waste meat anyway, and you're going to waste time and effort. Um, yeah. you, know, you can go out and shoot all you want, but if you don't get that head shot, you just spent a bunch of people to shoot something and can't use it commercially. And you're not talking about portraits. You're talking about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> shooting them in the forehead. Why? The deer look cute. <laughs> And then when you, you kind of said the alternative is, you know, shooting from a helicopter, is that what is happening with tip, typical animals that are overpopulated that don't belong somewhere? That's Yeah, that was actually being done on Maui, and, and um, there's just too many, and so they were eradicating it that way. And so that's why the idea came about. Like um, Desmond saw that there was a need. You know, it's it's a good food. It's better for your lower cholesterol, no fat, and mm. so it's just a way better product, and it's really sweet, and it's um, it's healthier. It's healthier for you. What if you were able to sell it? If if they're shooting them from the helicopter, could folks still take it and eat it with with that note of how much better it is for them? No, because they're probably spooked at that point, and they've released their endorphins and whatever other goodies. So are it's inside. not so it's not advised, but. If yeah. Those of you that eat. You shouldn't. If you medicine. don't know, did you <laughs> see it get shot at that point? And then are you going to run in front of another shot? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking of food waste, food waste. Um, don't do it. <laughs> so, can you, have you tasted venison that, okay, because I have seen folks that are just kind of, it is available just like off of trucks and such, people that aren't certified to hunt it. So, folks that buy venison that way, can you really taste the difference? Yeah, and I think that's part of the issue in the state is that uh, people aren't used to venison or right. Hawaii venison, and people are surprised that there's venison in Hawaii. What? There's deer in Hawaii? Mm. Um, or they've gone somewhere else and had venison, which is a little different than what we have here. This, this venison doesn't get as big as some of the mainland, like the whitetail and um, other types of 
deer in the mainland where they're eating whatever is there okay. or they're being hunted and there's predators. Mm. So that creates a different environment for the animal, right? Mm. So um, the venison here live a pretty nice life. They're eating pretty good and, you know. No predators. No predators, so they're fairly calm. They're not always running away from uh, wolves or what have you. So um, it definitely tastes a difference. And this is, so this is up from your website? Yes. Do you want to talk about some more so venison's good? Okay. It's healthy food. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's healthier for you. Like I said, it's lower cholesterol. You know, doctors recommend it. it uh, if you have diabetes, you need to get off red meat to lower your cholesterol, then start using venison. Um, so it helps with your diet. Athletes really love buying this darker red meat. It's richer in iron and protein, higher protein level than your cow that you would get. Um, Great for healthy cooking, so that that's covered. Um, and lots of recipes. It's you can do so many things with it. You can get unhealthy with it too if you want. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it tastes better if you do. That's the alternative website. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But there's a lot. It's very versatile meat. It's mm -hmm. it's really good. You can do a lot with it. We we've, we've been trying to educate people on how to use it. And so we do um, corned venison, we do corned venison sandwiches, we do tacos, jerky. Um, jerky is the, the thing that people are really into right now. It's, it's like everywhere you go, people are creating new jerkies. And we're trying to do a lot of jerky in different flavors and styles. And um, it's great for camping and hunters love taking it with oh, them yeah. camping and uh, when you're hunting <laughs> while you're hunting, hunting yeah, here, like, you can eat venison I'm jerky deer at the same time it's just a circle of life that's great <laughs> um, yeah it's it's a great product it's very versatile and, and it gets real fancy um, we've been trying to sell it to restaurants and the problem with the restaurants is they they're still being educated we're trying to help them understand that it's not going to be the exact, everybody wants to rack because it's beautiful, right. it sits on the plate nicely, but you're not always going to get the exact rack. It's not like we're slaughtering the cow at 1,200 pounds every time. Yeah. It's the inspector says, okay, you can kill that one, that one, and that one, and, and then we shoot it, and that's it. Like what, There's no control over the size of it. It, it is right. what we get. Right. It's right. wild an animal. It's mm -hmm. a wild animal. So. So it sounds like some of the similar issues that you have, like the local pork industry. I know a lot of times when they slaughter, you know, you want the, the loin or the belly or even the shoulder. Mm -hmm. But then what happens to the rest of the, the rest of the meat? So figuring out different right. ways to use that. Right. It's preferred and easier for us to sell the whole thing, but we have to get creative. And what we've been doing Hawaii venison is that we take what we can for the jerky, which is a little more than you can... Uh, with cows because it's leaner so there's not as much fat and then creating stews um, chilies got you some stew right yeah, that's great. so that's that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to get creative and using everything and then um, also using the high to do different things this is a uh, kale uh, with chocolate sauce venison um, and some pickled cabbage it's just Oh. tasty I'm getting hungry where, yeah where is that where was that is that something you made in yeah picture? oh okay I, I wow. get creative at home quite yeah, a bit you do. so that's <laughs> why big boy huh <laughs> <laughs> you know what they call a skinny Indian right uh, yeah, I don't know. bad hunter okay and on that note of you know needing to kind of educate folks what as opposed to other I guess your other thing has been kind of catering. So as this product that you're trying to educate folks, you're kind of have a, a couple of different avenues of that. You're not just selling it in the grocery store. Can you kind of talk about your difference? If, if you're primarily focused on restaurants, like you said, you have some of your products now with Oahu Fresh. I believe at one time you were talking about a, I don't know if this is the co-op part, but a, like a club where you get it every month. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to figure out the right way to approach it and uh, we thought about creating a co-op where we charge and that way we're not sitting on product. It's mm. The pro product is always going to be better the fresher you get it and um, you eat it within a week it's better than s having it sit in the freezer. Right. Um, so we thought about doing a co-op and then convincing people to like okay prepay it, you're a part of the club and then you get this monthly package of whatever you want. Um, like a buyer's club. Yeah, and but 
looking at that, we weren't sure if that's the right model, and we're still trying to figure out that model. But so what we've been doing now is making it available through Oahu Fresh, and then we're looking at opening up a, a lunch wagon, and then also looking at the potential to open up our own restaurant where we also can sell the meat. So okay. more of a charcuterie style deli where we have high-end meats or exotic meats, uh, bring in other wild meats from other places where they're doing population control as well, and then having people taste it and then get recipes mm -hmm. and buy the raw product as well. Oh, cool. So that's really what we want to go towards. And you can get the meat from us now uh, through the website, mm -hmm. or you can visit uh, Kokua Kalihi Valley. Uh, we have a little space where we're selling it over there as well. And that's where so. your commercial kitchen is? Yes. Okay. Kokua Kalihi Valley, the Roots Cafe. Okay, great. So we're going to take a quick break, and that was a good segue to talk about some of the other things that you're involved with. It's super exciting to just hear about these new ventures and kind of getting creative with the business models and your whole vision of everything you want to incorporate. So we're going to take a quick break and get right to it. Okay. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on ThinkTech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha. This is Reg Baker. I'm the host of Business in Hawaii. We air every Thursday at 2 o'clock on thinktechhawaii.com. We broadcast from the ThinkTech studios in downtown Honolulu, and we talk about positive and successful companies in Hawaii, people that have been successful despite the obstacles. They all have a good story to tell. Hopefully, we'll see you on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Aloha. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. I am Anu Hittel, and I host a show on climate change. It's called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. And in it, we go beyond outrage to look at solutions to global climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. Join me every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha, namaskar, and goodbye. Rolf with. Aloha and welcome back to another episode of Why Food and Farmer series. I'm your co-host Justine Spiritu. Sitting next to me is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Today's guest is Ignacio with the Hawaii Venison Co-op. Not co-op yet. Maybe soon to be working on the co-op Hawaii part. Venison. Yeah. Hawaii Venison. Great. So we were able to get a lot of information about um, kind of the unique issues involved with your product. Why it's it's kind of, you're serving an important role of kind of keeping this invasive species in check and the health benefits. And so we want to go back in time a little bit. <laughs> Matthew loves to go back in time. <laughs> so let's go back in time. Is there a button? <laughs> yeah. We need to get this like, you know, back in time yeah. production thing going. So let's kind of talk about where your interest in food started. Um, I know you grew up here, and food is kind of an integral part of the, the culture, and I think you, kind of the work you're doing in education, not just with your product, but your other work, kind of, that all really ties together, and I'm excited to talk about that, because we haven't talked about that so much on our show. Sure. So. Um, got into food business by accident, actually, but there's always been a background in it somehow. Um, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in the mainland, and mm -hmm. also learn traditional hunting. I, when I hunt for, so I have a catering business, and when I hunt for the catering business, it, I use a longbow and tracking, no dogs. It's the same approach, you know, you, like we're trying to take it quietly mm. and pray for it during and after. And um, so my background comes as a child learning how to hunt and, and look at food. And then, so one grandfather was this German Apache uh, guy, and then my other grandfather on my mother's side was a Sicilian mm. uh, who moved to Mexico and married a, a Mexican woman. She was born in Spain, but moved to Mexico. And 
Um, so this rich background of culture and different foods, and mm -hmm. uh, they own a ranch in, in Mexico, and it, my Sicilian grandfather, I mean, he would make pasta from scratch and make sausage, you know, we'd kill the animals. I mean, he was so creative, he would, he would make uh, these racks and dry spices on these racks, and he would burn different woods and oh, to wow. get these different smokes and these spices and salts. And so it was an amazing background to see this as a kid, and then helping to slaughter and then also feed 16 people working on their ranch, right? Oh, so, so kind of hands was in there already. Yeah. Um, never thought I would do food because I, I love food and it's kind of like one of those things if you do art, you don't really want to get into right, the right, business Right, make it a it. job. Um, so it was a long road. It was by accident we got into it. We, we were playing around with an app and, and the app was about sacred places and and then the idea was that you could come to these sacred places, but we wanted you to get your hands dirty mm. and harvest food or clean the heiau or whatever, and then we would feed you from wherever we went. Mm. And we did a practice run, and then all of a sudden it turned into, hey, that was good, can you do catering? And I was like, well, <laughs> sure, why not? And so, Like, hey, forget about that app. <laughs> yeah. Focus on that food you made. So that's kind of where everything kind of took a direction, you know, you just kind of follow the wind and see, see where it goes and you don't always control what the business is going to do, right? Yeah. Um, so it's been really nice to do that and then also to educate people and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we do Ipono food and we bring in local traditional foods and then blend it with European. Uh, so there's a lot of different influences there and, and so the way we treat and approach food is I basically, when I have people come and train or I have people work in the kitchen approaches is pretend this is your grandmother's last meal, you know, wow. how you cut it, how you're thinking about <laughs> it. If this is the last meal, is this what you would feed her? And you should be that way towards everyone. So. It can be awkward if grandma was actually there. <laughs> <laughs> Give you the stink eye. Yeah, grandma's like, what? It's my last meal, boy. <laughs> So, and then, so when you're, when you're talking about this, you're, you're talking about incorporating local food here in Hawaii. Right. So you kind of have this blending of the, the cultures that you grew up with. Right. And then um, really getting into the local culture here. Yeah, yeah. So Sorry we do... I made up that you grew up here. It's okay. We make up half the stuff we <laughs> And But my, my father was born on Kauai, so I feel like That's been here forever. Close enough. Yeah. That's where Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of family here, and, and yeah, we're pretty tied locally. So, um, I've, you know, it's, I've traveled around the world and doing different things, but in obviously food is like food and art and music are the cross-cultural mm -hmm. ways to communicate, right? And so, yeah, I've, I've always, wherever I go, it's, it's funny. I have a weird, uh, I don't know what you call it. I guess it's a gift. I, uh, I can smell <laughs> something and taste it, and then I can duplicate it. I was like, I think it was missing something. Let's add this. And uh, so I've been pretty lucky that people love like, the food. <laughs> like a, a musician who can just hear something and then play right. it. It's like, nope. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's uh, I've been pretty blessed to have that skill. And, and um, so then, because of that, I get to play. At roots with food and and to me it really is like playing you know you get to create something and try to make it beautiful and taste good at the same time and it's not about making it look like some piece of artwork but making it look presentable and nice right mm. it's not like the we're gonna freeze stuff and do some crazy new thing so like, let's just make it a really nice home-cooked meal yeah, and yeah, yeah. and serve that and uh, talk a little bit about roots a little background on that you mentioned it a few times now sure so roots cafe is part of a uh, kokua kalihi valley okay. Kukua Kali Valley has a, a, a clinic and a dental center, and uh, it's a nonprofit. And then they also have a 100-acre park in the back of the valley in Kalihi. Mm -hmm. And their model is to feed and help people get, and get in touch with their culture and the food and medicine and even traditional medicine, and then um, to take care of the valley. Basically, there's, there's some hurt in that valley, mm -hmm. and it's about healing that valley. So mm -hmm. that's probably the best way I can describe that. That's a good description. And, and then Roots Cafe is in the dental clinic and it's a cafe that's open on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 to 1, 22 to 29 North School Street, everyone. Um, 
I run the cafe on Thursdays, and we do all kinds of food. I take it around the world and do all kinds of crazy things with local products and mm -hmm. then bring in different, like the venison. Sometimes we do venison stuff there, and uh, we've been doing, uh, what are we doing? Sicilian sausage sandwiches. We're doing salami with the venison. And so all these different ideas and products are, you know, coming up and testing it with the market there. And, People love it, so... What about great. some of your great vegetarian dishes? Oh, yeah. There's some. I had recently some eggplant, I think, and vegetarian enchiladas. Oh, yeah. That, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we love meat. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's delicious. Uh, but, yeah, everything at the cafe is... Um, we do a vegetarian, vegan uh, plate, and then we do a meat plate, a protein plate, and then we do uh, salads, and then we do a soup. So you get these different things you can get there. And the vegetarian stuff, I mean, for a while I was vegetarian for several years, and mm -hmm. I strictly um, followed being a vegetarian unless I hunted it myself. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to do in Oahu. On the mainland, it's a little easier to just go in the backyard and get a deer, <laughs> right? But yeah. here it's a little bit harder. Um, and, the, you know, you get off that plane, it's like la-la time, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> broke the whole vegetarian <laughs> thing. Right. Um, but... Yeah, we make great vegetarian food, and we use a lot of the product that we grow there in the valley. Mm. Um, so that's pretty special. It's it's awesome. Everyone's getting their hands dirty and learning at the same time as feeding and helping people get better. Not just, um, I guess, spiritually as well as if you're coming to this clinic and you get assistance, you should also get outside and get some sunshine and get a little exercise and get some good food and take some home with you every third Saturday. There's a work day for the public, and uh, it's recommended that when people come and you work for the day, you work for about four hours, and we feed everyone. Then you take vegetables home for yourself and then your elderly neighbors. Oh, wow. So that's that's important work that's being done there. Yeah. Nice. And what kind of stuff is is actually being grown there? Is it a lot of traditional? There's traditional things, or foods. Or just what grows easy. There's a lot of traditional food, and also yeah, there's a lot of the easy stuff. Um, Kalo is being grown, Wala is being grown, there's also uh, traditional medicines being grown, mm. a lot of kale, you know, your standard stuff that you find easy to grow in Hawaii. Um, and a lot of what goes on there is education, so we work with kids as well in, in the community, you know. If you walk around that community, you, you see the little stores and kids are walking around. Mm. You can tell they're already diabetic, they're having ices in the morning, so it's mm. re-educating these kids instead of eating spam musubis that... If you're gonna have a spam with sweet, maybe come try uh, Caillou. The director makes a homemade, which in Sato pork mm. spam, right? Which is healthier instead oh, of the yeah. junk stuff. And so there's alternative. We're trying to teach people that there's alternatives to the junk food. Um, so I think that's probably the more important thing that we do is trying to educate the future. We did a program. I think it was in October. I did a program with 22 kids, where it was all on. Uh, knowing yourself and place, and mm -hmm. then discovering that everything you need is already inside you and all around you in the environment. Mm -hmm. And it was around venison, but the tool was really to teach that who you are is already there, and, and what you need to know is is all around you. You don't need you don't need the iPod, you don't need the cars, you don't need all this stuff to to be who you are and be a great person and, and to mm -hmm. survive. That it's already inside you and everywhere around you. And, mm -hmm. So we used the venison from nose to tail. I taught them uh, brain tanning, how to make weapons with the tool, with the bones and the antlers. And so it was fun. The kids got oh, to I bet they love that. take the hide and brain tan and get their hands all dirty. So <laughs> they really enjoyed it. And, and then all the adults, of course, were like, can I take that class next? <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. I think I want to ask a, a bunch more questions about that. We're going to take another quick break. I'm going to ask 500 questions about that, and then we'll move on to what you kind of see for the future of sure. ag here. Thanks. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. 
Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Gr Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host Justine Espiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. We have Ignacio from Hawaii Venison and we left it on a cliffhanger mm. of this epic class uh, where you take, um, so it was restricted to teenagers or? It was like kids. I mean, some of them are as, as young as nine mm. till I think 12. Something like that. Nine uh, to twelve. Maybe a little older, yeah. And this is a, a day program or over so a weekend? So they call it Ehuola, and uh, it's during the breaks, the school breaks that they have. Um, and they just had one where the kids got to go to uh, La Ie or around there and spend time around the ocean. And so it's pretty cool because they're learning traditional ways. And, and even though the venison is a traditional from Native America, but. Mm. It's the same idea as when people live close and in relationship with the land, um, you get a lot of the same thing happening where there's a lot of respect and honoring the land and the, and the food that you eat. Yeah. It seems like a lot of really good lessons for these kids, especially what you're talking about where they're used to like the iPods or TVs or whatever. Yeah. And this is actually stuff that they're going to be stoked about because you start showing them how to you know, clean an animal or talking about hunting. Like what kid wouldn't love to go and do that? Yeah, it was, it was awesome and it was cool to see them because I took them out and said, "We're first. We're going to learn how to breathe, because mm. everyone's forgotten how to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. And then how we walk on this earth, and when we track, and then teaching them about um, in life, you're either the hunter or the prey, and what kind of a hunter are you going to show up as, right? And um, that's good. Add a little bit of paranoia in there to the kids. <laughs> that's always good. <laughs> well, if you're seeking success, right, you, you're going to be on either side of that, right? Yeah. And so." be well prepared. A good hunter is always well prepared and can work with whatever um, is given to you. And uh, one of those valuable lessons, it, it, this might be a little long, but I remember the first bow and arrows that I made and went hunting with, um, and I, I shot it, you know, I let it fly and I missed and I was really upset and I went over there and I grabbed my arrow and I threw it down and my grandfather just shook his head and said, sit down. And so we sat down and he goes, you see this arrow? Uh, there's nothing wrong with this arrow. And he said, this arrow has a soul. God allowed you to take this arrow and carve it. And mm -hmm. it let shine itself as an arrow to you. This bow was given to you as well. I've had arrows for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little crooked. Maybe there's something, you know, going not right with it. But it doesn't mean it's a bad arrow. It means you have to learn how to work with it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes wind will carry it. Something, you, but that lesson was really teaching me about not throwing away things and especially people. Mm -hmm. We so easy to sit there and throw away people because they've made yeah. mistakes or mm -hmm. we can't work with them, let's fire them. But I mean, that was a heavy lesson for a kid, but I was oh, like, yeah. I got it right. I was like, okay, okay, I get it. But sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I get it, grandfather. Nice arrow, right. nice arrow. <laughs> can, we, can we keep hunting? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really thankful for that lesson because yeah. it's, it's helped me a lot in life and, and um, it is true. I mean, we, we take things for granted or mm. we take people for granted and kind of cast them aside sometimes. And, and mm. so it's learning how to work, again, with learning how to work with what we've got. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the kids got a lot out of that. And also, like, when you learn to track and when you walk mm. and counting the steps on the trail. So I took them on a trail and had them count the steps in and then count the steps out mm. and really getting familiar with trails and then also building the fire the right way, building a, a, a space for camp and, mm -hmm. um, and looking at all the garbage that we found and then taking that garbage and making more hunting tools with it or making a trap. And it really, it was, it's that whole 
being prepared for life and being creative with everything that you're given. So that's. It sounds like uh, kind of like the cooler version of Boy Scouts. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. You don't make them wear those like goofy handkerchiefs and you were a Girl Scout, right? <laughs> no, my yeah. sister was. Uh, okay. Uh, I like the cookies. Um, so how is this kind of class um, put together? Were you involved in the development of it? Is this out no. of KKV? Or, I, I've or done, through? so the, the parts that I did, because they contracted me out to help them do that for the kids. and. Uh, KKV does programs like that where it's Aina based, pro, you know, education and yeah. cultural um, education. And they learn Hawaiian, they learn chanting, and they do all these different things. And um, so KKV does that, and, and you can get a hold of them through their website, kkv.net. And Caillou Odom, in charge of Roots program, she's in charge of that. And they have a summer program coming up. Oh. And it's very limited. They try to keep it to those 22 kids, so it's easy to work. Working. So was it a different program every time this was? Yeah, and so they try to get creative. I, I did it the year before in the summer, so it was a whole summer series where we're training them to cook. And so whatever we're getting from the Aino over there, um, we, we learned different recipes. And the kids, at the end of the summer, they got to make a big feast for all of the workers and also the parents and families. So they did an emo, and it was really cool. Cool. Yeah. So Iggy, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of like the future for some of your venison products. This is a, a new company that just started, you said, a couple months ago. Um, and then how does that lead into, you know, we're all kind of working towards trying to make Hawaii more food sustainable. How does that all tie into the larger picture of what we all need to do? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, is making sure that the business keeps going. Um, the hunters have jobs in Molokai, mm -hmm. and it's not... Uh, neg negatively affecting the farmers who are growing you know, our, our lettuce and our other products on those other islands. Um, so helping control that population is important. What we're doing is trying to get more people to get the venison um, in different ways whether, and trying to teach them to not be scared of it. I think people are scared. It's, it's a little harder to take a um, $14 piece of steak versus a, a Three dollar ground meat mm. and make something nice with it, right? There's less risk involved, and if you're afraid of doing something wrong with that steak, right, it, right. It's, you know, it might hit the pocketbook. And we realize it's expensive. Shipping is expensive. It's not the cheapest product, but it is a better product for you. Mm. Um, but learning how to stretch it, like making the stews, making mm. uh, meatballs, and, and doing different things with it, and then also uh, making the jerkies. That's really where we want to go. Where um, we can create a lot of different products that people can enjoy and um, share with others. And we're like giving away the recipes. We want people to try it out. We want them to see there's an alternative that's healthier for you. And, mm -hmm. and um, this is all this is all venison. Yeah, yeah. So we've been making sausages. We've been making corn venison. Um, making Are these pictures that you guys took. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then we have. Um, what else have we been doing with it? All kinds of stuff. And like it's charcuterie, right? And I hope I'm saying it right. I think that's the right way. <laughs> my French, my new new wife is French, and she's like, "It's charcuterie, not charcuterie." <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so she then didn't, she, she didn't call in. And probably. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, every time we, I say charcuterie, she'll call in. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so. Yeah, we want we want to be creative. We want other people to be creative with it, and, and uh, we're trying to make it available at different places. We're hoping Dia will take it on, and mm. um, definitely we'll have it at a lunch wagon. We're gonna try to do a lunch wagon soon, and I mean that's the best. We do a, a chocolate rub with rosemary um, venison on the fire. It's ridiculous. Oh wow! And so it's really good. And, uh, we start telling our guests to bring <laughs> bring samples, bring <laughs> samples to every show. Yeah, well, I just did our wedding, and we came up with a new recipe. It was a uh, stir fry with venison, and mm. it was really good. And it was uh, soaked in papaya and chili and garlic, and then oh, wow. tossed with the greens and a bunch of yeah. kale. Is there anything that's not recommended, like to replace with venison? Don't eat all my share. No. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it can be. It, you can, it can do anything with it. We're like list. doing a venison long rice. We're gonna do soups. We're gonna do the Apache stew is really awesome. It's it's uh, 
it's all fire roasted peppers, poblano peppers, mm. tomatillos, and cactus. It's what you would have eaten traditionally, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, you can do anything. And our favorite thing that people always want more is uh, the pasta. We make pasta and we make you know meatballs or meat sauce with it from scratch. Oh, wow. and, uh, and you're making all these products in the KKV kitchen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so. And we're making it available, and we'll have some more available through Oahu Fresh as well. Oh, so yeah, I hope so, yeah. We're hoping to get some of the other stuff to you yeah. soon. And uh, jerky, we want people to get on the jerky. I mean, it's really awesome product, and we use none of the, what do you call them? We don't have those bad preservatives. Mm. We use all the um, good preservatives as dried celery powders and citric, you know, citric straight from the dried powder citric acids and stuff yeah, to yeah. preserve it and lots of salt and smoke so yeah. so the the jerky where can you get that right now is that available hawaiivenison.com oh, <laughs> yeah okay um but we also have it out of the back of our truck <laughs> 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 but it's all made in the certified kitchen and um at kkv we we sell a lot of it out of kkv mm -hmm. and just word of mouth and we're just trying roots cafe they could just yeah come roots cafe tuesday and... thursday yeah and also the Apaches too. We're, we have an honor system, right? You, there's a basket. You can take it out of the fridge and leave the money in. It's so, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> right on. Yeah. So how does this kind of tie into your kind of larger vision of um, kind of next steps of, you know, making different... So, because there's a lot of talk right now about there's not being many economic opportunities for local ag, but after talking to you, it seems like there's all types of opportunities. How, how can we get more people doing stuff like you're doing yeah I mean a lot of it is just getting creative I, I think part of that I was lucky to learn that at a young age when I was teaching the kids right where just get creative with it and, and do different things and uh, like the the fella out in Waina who's doing the the gold uh, Kiave beans yeah and that's an old Apache product right we've been using that forever and also using an invasive product which right. is an annoyance for people right and and you can there's tons of stuff you can make medicine out of things you can you know figuring out what parts you can use what's there and try to avoid bringing new crops in that aren't mm -hmm. native as yeah. well you know yeah, and, yeah. Uh, just create getting creative with the land that we have and what works I think I've always thought if there was a way to bring back traditional medicines and grow them on a large scale that, you know, if people got behind it and marketed it correctly, it would, it would do really well, you know, mm. and, and help heal people. I mean, and, you know, most of your prescription drugs come from an original source of plants, so right, why yeah, not right. get back to that mm. um, and grow it on a large scale? Why not? It's, mm -hmm. it's important and it supports traditional foods and traditional way of being. And, um, but yeah, getting creative. I mean, I think fish, all kinds of stuff, drying it out and, and doing like, you were talking about ulu earlier, we were having a conversation and uh, we did a dinner where it was uh, heavy on ulu and you know, we did a lot of different things including ice cream and all kinds of fun stuff, so. Awesome. Right on. Well, that about wraps up all the time we have. Thank you so much for just talking to us about your experience yeah. and your business ventures and your ideas. You're such Thanks. a great <laughs> wealth of knowledge. I'm so excited that you finally came on. Yeah, Thanks. we finally got him. Yeah. He agreed to my invitation. I know, I know. No interest in coming on my show. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks again. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks we'll for having me. We'll be back next Thursday. And if